Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the war. We are about to sing songs about the Asian people, and we have one of the persuasion here with us, named <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Lee. Uh, and he does not have a problem with me calling him on the Asian persuasion. Mm -hmm. He is not Chinese. It's, it's, it's what I am. He's I, Asian not Chinese. He's one of these, but it's not Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Can the audience guess which ease I am? Which ease is he? And let's do that. The, the poll is out. Which, which right. ease do you think Jay Lee's ease? <laughs> which of the ease is Jay Lee's? Let's see how good you guys are. Come on. Let's see. Let's see how uh, racist the audience is to not know what mm -hmm. ease he be. That's right. How racist are you? Hey, Dolores. Yes, let's find out. Vietnamese, no manies. Mm -mm. Try again with another. <gasps> Somebody, oh, I not that easy. Koreanese, <laughs> Koreanese, Koreanese. Yeah. That's a new one. <laughs> well, he's Koreanese, e, so they had to add the e's. Koreanese, Koreanese, <laughs> the at e's. They would add the e's, wouldn't they? <laughs> Japanese. Somebody said Hangul. So who's, who got it right, Jaylee? <laughs> who got it right? Even without the E's, I think somebody got it, didn't they? Yeah. Oh, just, was they it, just uh, need to take off the E's part because just take off the E's. Arby. It's just Avery, Korean. Arby? Abbott. No, he's the he's the other N. It's the Korean. <laughs> yeah, he is Korean. Coriander. I don't call him. Korea. He's a Korea. Korea. Mm. He is yeah. King Jong Uv twin brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. He <laughs> will cut you with the many a machete. You know, I know a lot of people like I'm so Rory dunk on Kim Jong Un, but I mean, honestly, like that's the ultimate kind of like power trip for a male fantasy, right? Just being in charge of an entire country, country. doing whatever the hell you want. Yeah, like you just do whatever you With want. Nothing you to know? show for it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, but so... <laughs> you're a dude in charge. Like that's that's just like the the male power trip fantasy right there. It's like no, I get to no, do whatever I want. There's tons to show I'm for it, and then and then you you invite Dennis Rodman over, and it's fine. Ah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Go. I'm so Cause that, Rory, cause he's Rory. He's Rory. I'm he's so Rory. Rory. I'm so, so Rory. Rory. You, we gotta stop there before. Me, do you remember that stink that they made over uh, that movie? Dennis Rodman. What was it called again? Oh, the one where they went to go kill him. Yeah, the interview? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The interview, yeah, the interview yeah. that, was. that movie yeah. was great. I liked great, it. Great piece of movie right there. Yeah. Like, yeah, you're great. like, we're gonna nuke you guys if you play that, and they played it anyway. So that was, yeah. that was... <laughs> so the opium wars. Mm. Um, you'd be amazed to know whether or not, uh, or you'd be amazed to know that the U.S. had a hand in the second opium war, and you would be surprised to know exactly what their hand was in that, mm -hmm. and how much of a um, blueprint it was going to be for. <laughs> international commerce when it came to um, the drug culture in America, as well as backdoor trades, deals, black market, all of that stemmed from our participation in the uh, second opium war. So hmm. before we get kicked off on this, and I'll give you a quick breakdown, uh, have an ear for this commercial break. Hey you, would you like Too Strong to promote your product or your social media platform? We have over 200,000 subscribers and followers combined. We'll promote your product or channel in the beginning of our live show. You can also provide us a link and we'll put it in our comment section forever. Get started today. All you have to do is email us at twostrongpodcast at gmail.com. Any and all promotions are subject to approval by Fair Media. All right, all right. So, Opium War. Um, between September of 1839 and somewhere in the region of 1856, 57, the Opium Wars had occurred. Um, this was an effort by Great Britain to try and um, find a way to not have to pay China with silver because they had very little and that was the only way china was accepting any payments was yeah from silver and they had to find That's a way nice. to make sure yeah. they can do stuff without silver so they couldn't sell opium because it was illegal but they yep. did have and this is what i told people about the british empire they're slick they had control over india and they can do things through india on behalf of them but they had to do it via the black market mm -hmm. so they eventually started to export opium to china 
And at first it was, no, we don't want it. And then it became, okay, we'll have to sell it to them via the black market. Now it became such a industrious trade on the black market. They were selling, I think, um, casks of it for almost $600 per. Um, and okay. at some point they were up to somewhere in the region of 25,000 barrels a year transporting to China. So it was very lucrative. And then they decided to flesh it out in treaties where they would say, okay, fine, we'll make it legal for a bit. And then there was more trees where we say, okay, we won't make it legal. And then there were missionaries and certain Chinamen that were not wanting to make anything to do with opium because it was breaking down the country in terms of the men were being unproductive. Oh, yeah. They would just sit around smoking ope and uh, neglecting their family. And yep. the Chinese government, I think it was the uh, the emperor at the time who thought he was a, a god. Um, well, they all think like that. Well, that's, yeah. that's, that's all emperors at all times. Right? They do that. So he thought well, he was a god. It's interesting Hold on, let me, because, let me you know. This real quick. Okay. Let me just finish this one thought real quick so I get it out so I don't forget because I'm old. Um, so he thought that in his mind, if he could try and curtail it, he could control the thing again. But unfortunately, by that time, the commerce in the back door was going too strong. The missionaries couldn't stop it. And he finally appointed one guy to take care of it. And even then, it kind of failed in its full aspect. And so his efforts then were to try and curtail it from the population side. And he decided to punish the citizens as opposed to the people selling it and started a small, just a tiny genocidal movement to, if you didn't want to get punished, you'd end up getting killed. So go ahead, I'll continue. Oh, I was just, I was just going to say, it's, it's the idea of chasing the dragon, where the idea of the chasing the dragon came from in, in Drug Halfway House is um, just, I mean, if you yeah. look at old movies, I mean, even, even I, I believe in Great Britain, they were, Chinese immigrants would literally create the market for, for drug houses. Right. And, and stuff like that so like even you find so in China, you can only imagine anywhere yeah yeah so what eventually came about was a treaty in uh, 1842 and that was the treaty of Ninjang. um and eventually what it was it was well it was technically an unequal treaty <laughs> oh yeah it didn't really it didn't really benefit china at all um all it did was keep alive the trade without making the trade legal fully so the best way I can describe it is that in smaller quantities, but the mass amount that was coming in was not legal. And they were trying to keep ports open in order to do that. Eventually, the Chinese would attack ships that they thought had mass amounts of opium on it. It turns out that some of them were French and some of them were Spanish ships that had nothing to do with the trade at all. They were just there bringing goods. And eventually it had to become a global issue where the French, the Chinese, and, the, and Great Britain had to come to the table for either reparations for damaged goods, um, back payment, and sometimes in the region of somewhere six to seven million dollars were paid back and forth between China and, and the French. Um, and in my mind, I think that's where most of the hatred for the Western culture came from out of China because oh, yeah. they saw the demise that the Western culture was trying to bring into China. Okay, so they have their own culture, okay? They, they worship gods and all that stuff. Okay, fine, you leave them alone, but you want their their commerce. And the easiest way you found to do that was to bring in a... Now, I'm not absolving China of any um, hand in this because you did take the opium, even if, albeit through the backdoor channels, you did take the opium and your people became addicted to it. They became the number one consumer of opium in the world. I think some of the reason of eight, eight, so eight or six million people were using it at one time. Yeah, it was a lot. Uh, it was a I, was lot. Gonna point, I wanted to point out the fact that at this point in time, England had already outlawed opium mm -hmm. in the UK, right? So it was illegal to sell opium in the UK, but it wasn't illegal to trade it, to trade. right? And so the whole reason that the whole trade deficit between China and the UK happened is because they didn't have a silver, like you said before. And so they traded for opium in order to get spices and everything else that they wanted. Right. So that's where it came in. They were they if if they would have just had the money to pay for the things they wanted to buy, it wouldn't have been an issue. Right. Right. But they're like, all we got is opium. OK, I don't want opium, but all I got is opium. Either take it or. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and, and it's no different than what's going on today. I mean, right. We look at right. modern time, mm -hmm. you know, exactly what Coy said. It's illegal here in America. But guess what? The money's good when the government has their hand in it. So it's the same thing, yeah. man, you know. Think about a lot of stuff that's going to be said because it's going to make sense about what's going on today. Okay.
L- let me let me break something down for you, Susan. Okay, you might be new here. You might be new here, so I'm going to help you first before I do what I was about to do. So let me help you out. Our dynamic is our dynamic. This isn't it? Called? You know what we're called? We're called men. And if one of us has a point, you know what we'll do? We'll interject when it's time because we're not betas. Okay? So that's first off. I'm also called a moderator. All right? And so I'm disposing of the topic first. So people get a feel for it, and then we discuss. If that format is not suitable to you, Susan, Karen 2.0, you can feel free to find a different platform that suits your agenda. But you're coming into our facility to listen or not listen. If you don't want to listen, then shut your ears and vacate the area. Or you can sit down, shut up, and listen, and learn something for a change. If learning isn't what you want, this is probably not the platform for you. But do not come in here trying to say, oh, let somebody else talk. Okay? This is your only warning because I see that you're new. So you can shut up and sit down and listen or leave. Those are your two options. Or I can help you leave. Pick pick for yourself. I don't want to be you know, a chauvinist and kick you out of the room. But I could be if I really wanted to be. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure I clarify I that. For if anyone else had questions about how this runs, this is how it runs. Low IQ people. So my question is this. This question is this. so with the fact that they had all these treaties going on over the now, this is the crazy part over the illegal trade <laughs> of <laughs> opium <laughs> because neither China nor Great Britain had the ability or want to market opium on a scale that was legal. They didn't want anything to do with it, not the parliament. Not, not the Chinese government, none of them wanted to manufacture, sell, or trade opium on the legal side. None of them. But somehow it was so lucrative to the black market that they had to try and find a way to be able to transport it legally and still try and find a way to sell it legally with no ramifications. The easiest way is to go via India. India was one of the largest places that, mind you, UK had that territory all done for themselves. That was all them. So they could plant and grow it there. There was nothing wrong with that, but they couldn't traverse it through England and sell it directly to China. So they had to find a way to do a backdoor channel. So Mm. do you think that in doing that, that would be considered the very first drug smuggling operation (laughs) on a... yeah. I mean, international yeah, scale. but it's also it's also the first drug war that we see yep. mm-hmm. in the world too as well because there was an administrator in china at the time that was doing his own version of war on drugs right and that's what led to the first opium war in the first place is when he basically kicked out the british after they s- stabbed a couple of sailors too um that they, the sailors stabbed a couple of people and then they wouldn't turn them over and, and whatnot, different story. But point was, is that he said, you guys aren't, nobody's selling you food. Nobody's selling you anything anymore. Get on your ships and leave. Right. And the British didn't like that <laughs> very much. Right. So like this guy was going around doing his war on drugs and trying to get opium out of China at the time and to get the British to stop selling opium. It's like, it's not that they didn't want to trade with them. Right. That was still a lucrative deal for them. They just didn't want them to be paid in opium. <laughs> like, it's not that it wasn't that really that big of a deal. They just made it a big deal because the merchants at the time made it a big deal. Mm-hmm. There was actually pushback in Parliament at the time. Right. Uh, against what they were doing and saying it was bringing disgrace on the kingdom and the queen itself uh, herself by doing this. But nobody listened. I mean, just like, whatever. We're going to do it anyway. It's our, it serves our interests and what we want to do. They did, um, from what I can, can gather, the, the Chinese government, their biggest issue was that it was reducing productivity in the populace. Mm-hmm. Um, the addiction and the selling of it, I think, would have, or rather I should say the selling of it and the commerce of it would have been fine by them if the addictive qualities did not intrude on both their culture and productivity from their yeah. citizens and the destruction of, now this here this is the crazy part the destruction of their family nucleus yeah. they saw that men weren't taking care of their wives or their kids anymore you'd find them in opium dens getting completely shot up 
And then you also found a lot of the trade route, people were doing the same thing. They would find ships wrecked on ports, completely taken over, and you'd find men dead in either the, the hull of the ship, just gone with pipes. And so the majority of the time, whether it was legal or not, they kept using it as a um, escape from what was going on. Now, when the America stepped in, this is where things get a little more pertinent to, to us. And I think, I think we do have in, to recognize here also uh -huh. that this was pre-communist China. Yes. So so take that context in, in mind. This is pre-communist China. This is when when imperial, like like Chinese emperor kingdom dynasties were, were going on too. Yeah, so. this is the Qing dynasty, by the way, if you're wondering. The King Chong Qing Qing. So <laughs> the Qing you have dynasty. you have um now ports that were protected by US Marines. Now, I remember the last time we spoke, it was the advent of the Navy. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, now they have a <laughs> a job. <laughs> and it's, it's not even to protect American soil. They are protecting commerce with opium ships over in Canton. That's, that's yeah. the big problem here is that in Canton, they're now protecting illegal drug trafficking. Now, Sounds if, familiar. If it, 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 all right. So they were over there. And in um, 1853 is when um, they finally had a um, an interaction where the U.S. M Marines had to go and actually fight off Chinese invasions trying to come and curtail the opium shipments. In 1855, I want to say it was. The U.S. passed a Chinese Passenger Act, and what it created for them was a way for not only people to traverse with their way over to the United States, but if they wanted to escape either the regime that was going to about to come into China and come back with American ships, they could do that. What was also seen was an easy way to add a secondary leg to the opium trade. Um, mm -hmm. So if if you think that the U.S. didn't have an ulterior motive they're seeing the money transpiring between the UK and China. We're talking somewhere in the regions of a million to two million a year in opium trades, and they wanted in on that. And the easiest way to do that, that they found, was to act as the protector. This, that sounds awful familiar to how the U.S. military operates today. World police. That's what it is. World police. Ain't that something? They never really changed their, their mantra. The government found a way to make money, found a way to get into the middle of it and drag commerce their way. Here's my question to the panel. Hmm. Do you believe that the way the United States operated as the middleman, but not really the middleman, because they got paid from both sides. That's the crazier part. They got paid from China for citizens, and then they got paid from the UK for the protection of the opium. It, it was, I'm not telling you, it was a smart idea. Do you see the same model in place today in the U.S. government? Oh, yeah. And what? I mean, look, uh, look, yes. look at Afghanistan and what happened there. Mm -hmm. That's a good example, right? So, like, we are... At this point, everybody knows the CIA has been involved in the drug trade, right? In order to produce money, dark money that they can use for nefarious purposes throughout the world, right? So they use the drug trade in order to get that money pushed. One of the big key exporters of opium heroin, you know, these these types of things came out of Afghanistan. It was one of the major players. Mm -hmm. He protected opium fields. Mm -hmm. how, many, how many times did they tell us not to burn the fields? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I remember it was a big push to burn the fields. You know, there was a lot of units out there burning those opium fields up, and they were told to stop. Yeah. Then it got to the point, like Coy said, you had to protect them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there's some big money in play there because if you're if you're told to stop burning opium, you have to ask yourself why. I mean, so. the, the major excuse that they, they told us was that it was because it was the poor farmers, right? The farmers yeah. don't have anything else. It's their crash crop. They have to they have to sell it. It's like, yeah, but we're giving them money anyway. Why? Why would they need to continue to do that if we're already giving them money to win the hearts and minds? You, re you remember that? Whole yeah, thought, that, that, it, same thing. They would have paid them for it. But, you know, you would never. Here's the thing. We could have burnt every field down while we was there. It would have never stopped it. 
you know, it would have curtailed it just for a little bit, but it, it would have continued to grow. But like Koi said, if we would have burnt them down, they would have been compensated for all their all their crops. What was the it, reason they gave you for not burning it? That, you know, that like Koi a, said, it was mine. Hearts and minds. That's it, it was a, it, hearts and minds, and we didn't want the we didn't want the locals pissed off at us, and that was their way of income. We we didn't yeah, question then, how they were making money off of it. We were just right. told this is how they make money. It wasn't our business to care how they made it. <laughs> See, that's so interesting. instead of pissing them it. off, we had to leave them up. So that's yeah, interesting because as, well, that see, that's interesting because in. for me as a civilian. I always thought don't burn the poppy fields because or don't burn the fields because you know it would have affected the mental faculties of the soldiers who were doing the burning. <laughs> no. no. Wow. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> there would be that's what we were allowed to believe. Yeah, yeah, I know. But you so, then there's another part of this that nobody like seems to understand is that there would be a guy who is dressed up in civilian clothes in the middle of a war zone with mm -hmm. a briefcase full of money burning to do his some field. <laughs> <laughs> and and he's right. It wasn't like so when people think of it, they're thinking of like in Vietnam or something. Soldiers are actually out there standing in the middle of a field burning it. No, 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 no. That's yeah, not then. how it worked. We paid the locals to burn that. So you pay this guy a couple thousand dollars. Hey, I need you to go burn this field. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to burn the field while we're way back. We're gone probably at that time. Or we're right. there overwatching, protecting them. But we're nowhere near that stuff. So, you know. At the locals we did it. That's then crazy. Later on, it wasn't. We were just to leave it alone. Let the yeah. locals do the local things. And then there would be exchange of money and hands from shady people that we would just watch. We don't know who they are, but <laughs> I can guarantee you they're probably CIA. <laughs> Where are you getting this money from? <laughs> yeah, right? Just some random dude in the middle of like his dickies. Just it <laughs> with a briefcase. What's going on here? Who's that dude? I don't know, but we don't talk about him. Um. Wow. Yeah. Something just something just struck me. It's kind of I, I didn't I didn't think about this before, but obviously, um, there is a copycat fashion in which the United States took from China. Yeah, when it came to the interaction of the citizen and the monarchy dynasty things in China versus the United States government and its citizens, when the Chinese headship didn't want the people participating in opium usage they didn't go after the dealers they went after the user mm -hmm. and punished the user to the point where they would execute hordes of them as an example to the others to not use the drug the united states government does the exact same thing with the drug culture here the, mm -hmm. the user is the one that suffers the majority of the blowback as opposed to the seller. Um, the, you might catch a few of the big dogs, the big, big ones, but the ones that really get prison time is this, if you have possession of it. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of people that sell aren't going to be in possession <clears throat> on their person. It's mm -hmm. in a different location. But the users usually always have them on their body and if you check the way the, the 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 chinese government did it versus the way american did it it's the exact same so i have no doubt that when they made that passage treaty with them or pass it that passed that act that they also include a couple of just like they did with willie lynch they brought over um people that were in power to teach them how to exactly do the same the mm -hmm. same thing here how off right. base do you think that theory is? Do I you think, think it's a pretty plausible one. Yeah, I think it's pretty spot on. And, and you're right about the users. I mean, when I was working in a jail, you never really got the you never saw big time sellers in there. It was always like somebody who just had a little bit on them, somebody that was most likely a user. But the minute they realize as they start going after these big wigs, the deck, the house of cards are going to fall. And eventually, it, if they if the cards are falling hard enough, where is it always going to lead back to? Someone in government. So right. we're just going to get the users off the street. We're going to keep them in here for a couple of days. When they start going through withdrawals, we're going to supplement it with another medication. And then we're just going to kick them back out on the street. They don't care about, you know, catching the big wigs. Let's catch the users. Let's get them off the street and make revenue off of them. Right. 
Um, let, me, let me make sure I find this one thing here. That's kind of interesting we... too, as, as Marlon's looking for what he's looking for. Um, the so whole you... notion of the fact that governments are literally playing the same type of game. Like we're, we're talking about the United States of America, a constitutional republic that involved themselves in this little international scuffle. <clears throat> but at the same time, um, you have Chinese imperial dynasties also pulling the same kind of kind of prevention philosophy that really doesn't work, punishing the user versus punishing the seller. And, and it's just mm -hmm. interesting that, that we're so we're a couple hundred years removed from that era, and yet still we, we face the same type of governmental overreach. And it's just mm -hmm. kind of funny. Two different governments, and, same and, philosophical and, and just in multiple ways now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the fascinating things about this, especially in terms of history, is that we have to remind ourselves is that this is what happens when a technologically advanced civilization meets a underdeveloped civilization and how they get taken advantage of. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that's something we, we need to not forget as Americans is that we see ourselves as being the most advanced, but that might not necessarily be true forever. Right that could change very well change and i think that's what's happening in the us today and we can talk about we can talk about the more advanced but the more advanced you know you have to look at it as are we more advanced just because we have technology because a lot of these poor countries do the same things we do with less technology so who's more advanced you know what i mean <laughs> so right. uh, that's something else to think about but you know a good, with the Barbary Wars, like we talked about last week, I think that was the beginning of a lot of the issues that are going on in America today, especially when it comes to international issues. Yeah. Intervention. What, yeah. It, what if we would have just stayed an isolationist country and never even got involved in none of that? You know, where would we be right now? So uh, better off. <laughs> probably better off we sell democracy to these poor countries as uh, koi said you know under the guise of democracy and other things probably yeah. hey we're going to give you satellites we're going to give you this we're going to give you technology and a lot of these countries look at the west and uh, there are some poor people out there that really want what we have so they sell that we're going to put internet in your country we're going to give you this we're going to give you that we're going to do this and so then they invite them in and what do we go in we go in and take what we want yeah. from them and then make them the enemy for fighting what's theirs but this is also what changed china into what it is today as well right like this, uh -huh. this episode and this is what we're facing the consequences of that imperialist nature that the europeans had and that we got drugged into because mm -hmm. we didn't want to, we didn't want to lose that on the pie right it's like right. if you're not involved in the issue then you're not going to get a slice of the pie and that's what America was afraid of, is they didn't want to be left out while all the European powers got their colonies, right? Or what they, more trade that they got. They didn't want to be left on, with the empty bag. And that's where the problem stem from. Instead of focusing on ourselves with the vast amount of natural resources we have in the United States, we have decided we need everywhere else. Yeah, and you got to think about America, the ego that America probably had at that time. We just whipped the British, yeah. you know, 90, 80 something years prior. We're not going to let them do this well, we we're did, gonna we did you it. know yeah we did it twice yeah revolutionary war and then the war of 1812 because now we're in yes. what 1840s so mm -hmm. i I, so I can only imagine the ego yeah they had a chip on their shoulders they weren't gonna let the yeah. british take all that without them showing who the freaking real superpower was so a lot of it was ego this is I why we got involved with all this international yeah. stuff yeah uh, y'all y'all don't go after my boy jew that's my boy okay that's that's yeah <laughs> that's my boy simon yeah that's that's our, that's our remember boy. simon from forever ago we actually tried to start a podcast together, um, Simon and I. The tokens, if you remember correctly, twas the tokens yeah, that I we were going to call ourselves. <laughs> so you know, just just so you know, Simon Simon is one of a uh, one of the vintage members. Okay, <laughs> that's our the, that's our people right there. One of the original, one of the OGs. Okay, one mm -hmm. of the OGs. So I found the actual breakdown of the um, 1855 Chinese Passenger Act. That's what I was looking for. Okay. Um, this is what it says. And tell me if this sounds really familiar to, to how we operate, like, say, in Ukraine. Man, nothing has changed, bro. Like, it, God was right. Ain't nothing new under the sun. <laughs> no. <laughs> nothing. It's Here we go. Right. 
Whereas abuses have occurred in conveying immigrants from ports in Chinese in the Chinese Sea, and whereas it, it it is expedient to prevent such abuses, be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the Lord Spiritual and Temporal and Commons, it is present to Parliament that's assembled, and by the authority of the same, to allow, and they go down these different um, amendments, the definition of certain terms um, that they want to call Chinese natives, legislation over Hong Kong and the passenger ships that come from there, over the governor and the length of the voyages, uh, the Chinese passenger ships if they plead for amnesty, penalty bonds, uh, commandeering of ships, penalty of neglect, forfeiture, um, mode of enforcing the forfeiture. And so they went on not just to say, oh, hey, you are under some duress. You're under duress. You know what we'll do? We will enact something that will help you be able to tra traverse from the place that you're in that's so bad to come here. This is just advanced slave trading. Yeah. Because they left China after being oppressed. When they left there, they came, and this is where the advent, it was during the Second War that the advent of Chinese slaves were really starting to get really ramped up. They were called coolies, yeah. um, and I think this is also where the, um, the, the, the caste system that really became prominent over in the eastern lands really took root. It was there before, but it became a little more prominent within the slave trading. And if people think that that uh, chattel slavery was bad, yeah, it was, but that some of the atrocities that were handed off on these people under the guise of, of new start, fresh life, you get paid more, none of that happened. They got here, and when you couldn't fulfill your debt or you couldn't pay, you were executed. And that was by law, not by... There Something familiar in that. And what I think of how the Democrats act when it comes to uh, illegal immigration, right? Come here. We promise you a better life. Come here. The gates are open. We will help you. Even though it's illegal, we will help you. Hmm. You know, we promise you, you aid and food. And then they leave them be because they get what they wanted once they get into the States. So it's not any different. We see with, what we end up seeing here is this that. And there'll be multiple other wars that we talk about that this is what America did. The majority of wars that we end to, went into was not to try and help anyone. Just, just to be clear, very few, maybe a hand, not even, I wouldn't even say a handful, maybe three wars that we've ever been in benefited the people that we fought with or against. And mind you, these were not wars that the citizens wanted. These are wars that the government wanted. And since the military is following the function of the government, they really don't have a say. And you, your only say over this is how you elect these people. You were going to say, Jay? No, I was going to say, like, a, a prime example of the, minor <clears throat> the minority involvement of the United States is, we might go over this, but the Korean War. Mm -hmm. I mean... Koreans benefited from U.S. involvement by leaps and bounds, but I mean that—that's another—that's another—that's another episode. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but but it lends to reason that it was part of the Asian, Asian continental kind of treaty kind of thing that they had over there. It, it it this particular opium war affected not just that, but it, look at what look at where Hong Kong is right now. Yeah, look at the state yeah. Hong Kong is in because of what took place with 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 Great Britain. I will push back on uh, Jay Lee's point is the fact that none of this would have been an issue had the opium wars not happened to At begin all. with. Because mm -hmm. you got to think that this is what leads up to the Korean War, too. Like yeah, it's all yeah, part absolutely. of that. Once that yeah. humili uh, humiliation by the West against the East happened, it was not going to lead to good things. That's what led to the rise of Mao in the first place was right. this unequalness between the West and the East. And they yeah. looked for somebody to help them out of that and help them out of the poverty that they are in because of the disproportional trade that they were having mm -hmm. at the time. So the only reason we have the CCP is because of the opium wars. Mm -hmm. They created this issue to begin with. Yeah, they insulted the whole the whole shebang. 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we continue to do it today. And this is the predicament that we're getting in right now, modern day. All these countries that don't want nothing to do with the West, because historically, we have brought nothing but war. Hence why the Mm -hmm. BRICS nations exist today is because it's a creation of our own. You reap what you sow. So we got to figure this out and stop getting involved in all these foreign wars for reasons other than trying to help people. It's a lot of people want to have this idea that the current government structure and um, is based on race. It's based on money. It is it's money. It's always been money. Mm-hmm. They have hundreds and hundreds of years of proof of this, that every mm-hmm. time a government wants power, they don't want power because of how you look. They want money and they want power over you because of what they can get from your resource. Mm-hmm. That's it. Slavery was cheap labor. And because you were considered a mechanical part in the whole cog, you were expendable. There would just happen to be crazy people that knew how to expend of you in a very nefarious way to keep you subservient. That's how you operate in a business when you don't want people to rebel. It happens everywhere. It's happening right now in Venezuela. It's still happening in China. It happened in India with the, the UK jumping in there. It happened everywhere. It had nothing to yeah. do with color of skin. If you were poor, you got thrown in there. Yep. Yep. And everyone needs to think about good point that Marlon brought up is look in America and look at our social security numbers. You know, the only thing that thing is really tied to money without it. They said you can't buy, sell or trade. You really can't do anything as Mm -hmm. an adult without a social security number, which is nothing more than a stamp for modern day slavery. Yeah, it just yeah. looks different. You know what I mean? So think about that, you know, that number that you like to show and you want to buy things and you want to get things. But without that number, you get nothing. So here, here's the thing. Uh, I'm going to expand on what you were talking about because I was interrupting. you. I'm sorry. But it's your Social Security number. is just a way for the government to track what collateral they have to the Federal Reserve. Right. Because mm-hmm. people seem, seem to always forget the Federal Reserve isn't actually a government organization. It is a private bank that has been chartered to print money for the United States and they own our debt. It's not the other way around. Like you, people don't understand how the fed works, the lands and everything that the United States is, including your person is collateral for debt. Mm-hmm. So it's always been about money. Always been everything. About money. Yep. This I is why go I'm ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, go this ahead. is why when prisoners go to jail, Every day they're in jail, someone gets paid for that. Because like Coy said, you're nothing more than collateral. Your number is nothing more than collateral. Mm -hmm. So with the government owning that Social Security number, because technically it's not yours. When somebody takes that social and they want to put you somewhere, they have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting stuff. You guys might want to look it up. You you might want to look into the bonds that the criminal... (laughs) Has. Look it up. Look it up. I did find one thing kind of cool and crazy at the same time um, that I did not know. And I've been t- we've been told a lot in our schooling back home that the original um, colonizers of myriads of Caribbean countries um, came as a result of the failure of certain British royalty in this opium outcome. Hmm. There were at least three that got exiled pretty much to the Caribbean islands and were given jurisdiction over them as a punishment. One of them happened to be Trinidad. And he went down there and formed that colony to what it is now. That's why we were still under British rule, because we do, it was actually an exile type punishment, but it was still under the crown. And I found that I was like, that's kind of... It's kind of crazy. The far reaching implications of a drug war influenced mm-hmm. the far reaches of the Caribbean islands to the point where they <clears throat> exiled one of the people that created the commerce down there and brought Same slavery. Thing with Louisiana and then Jeez. also Australia. Mm-hmm. You know, those were basically penal, uh, penal colonies. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, America Louisiana, was too. You, you got, you sent people that were criminals and hookers to Louisiana. 
<laughs> to get him yeah, out of America your hair. America was too. If you married a hooker and you wanted to get out of jail, you, all you had to do was do that and go to America and go to Louisiana. There you go. You're free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, the Uyghurs. Mm. Um, <laughs> maybe someone can clarify this for me who knows more because I'm definitely not claiming to be a scholar on that part. Um, yep. They are the same as the coolies where they were looked down upon by the Chinese for what reason, though? They are ethnic uh, Muslims in the Zhejiang region, which is in the, sorry, give me orientation west, in the far west, uh, more towards where Tibet is in that region yeah. over there. So it's more closer to Pakistan, but there were more descendants of Mon- Mongols, really, but they're Muslim in nature uh, Muslim due in nature. to connective culture. There was a clash, a culture clash and, and a religious clash between the two. Because Maoist China did mm-hmm. not allow religious freedoms because in right. in Marx and, Carl, and and communism as a whole, religion always gets in the way. Right. So they had to eliminate religion, period. And so you can't really look too favorably on a religion that most people dislike there as a majority Han country. Sounds familiar. Yeah. Right. Message. <laughs> okay. Because I, as I know that and their name came up in my my looking around for this, you know, the opium mm-hmm. war things. Um, and I didn't have time to really dive into their history compared to what their interaction was with the Chinese dynasties. I didn't have any real time to look into it because it was never really a field of interest for me to look into, nor, nor did I have to. Um, well, you got to also remember, too, that the Chinese dynasties were very Buddhist in nature. Mm-hmm. and very uh, Taoist in nature as well, and, uh, along with some Confucian philosophies. Um, so when you have a, a majority Muslim culture clashing with a Taoist, Confucius, Buddhist culture, there's going to be some tension. And if you're the majority yeah. Buddhist, which is ironic, um, Buddhists always talk about peace and love and tranquility, and yet here they are clashing with, you know, ethnic Muslims. So it's weird, but yeah. yeah. It, it, it wasn't more pronounced until... Um... Mao came into power. That's when religious fervor kind of changed uh, into the nature that we see on leftist ideologies today is that religion is the enemy of reason, basically. Gotcha. Which I think is can be, and then also not at the same time. I think it gives people a moral flame, framework to build upon, and without it, people kind of lose a sense of self. You know, a cohesive <clears throat> community. That's what it brings. Um, is that conflict still going on? Of course, it's going on to today, right now. I mean, right? Yeah, I mean, say that they the camps and the ethnic cleansing of Uyghur Muslims aren't happening. Then yeah, it's it's going bad. <laughs> it's going real bad. Like well, I mean, didn't kind of... they use the Uyghurs to build the Olympics, Olympic um, yeah. the Olympic uh, venues in China yeah, during the Winter Games? And forced sterilizations yeah. happen as well. So if, if, if the people that are saying that there's a trans genocide happening and there are a legitimate genocide happening in China right now and nobody seems to care. Mm-hmm. Well, so. A lot of countries that are a genocide happening. But, yeah. you know, I think I think if I can make one wish, it might sound a little crazy, but uh, I would just wish every country would be isolationist for a little while and get our own stuff together <laughs> and not focus on other countries hey. problems. Hey, your I problem is your that. problem. You know what I mean? But it's never going to happen because, again, I think the minute the West starts getting involved, we try to bring our Western culture to a country that that is not built for our style of uh, governing or our culture. And that's kind of what happened during opium, opium wars, you know, and it's just been crap ever since. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I Um, um, I think. America needs to take one on the chin. Like, real good. I mean a real good one. Not like death and mayhem. I just mean, like, they need to take one on the chin to realize how good they have it. You know what I mean? Well, this bricks like, thing is kind of... been talking shit for way too long. He just needs to get a real good punch in the jaw. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Something like that. Just to take it take it down a peg. Just because we need a reset of priorities. Just a reset. Uh, That's what it means. China's the only one to get do that at this point. Mm. Yeah. 
which is unfortunate it. because they're they're not they're not exactly the best. They're gonna. <laughs> they look like they're they're probably gonna Godzilla us as opposed to just a smack on the chin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Don't say Godzilla. I don't want to. They going they gonna Godzilla us, bro. You know. No, you know, but you know, when, when it comes to globally, everything that happened in history is leading up to this moment today, as we all know. Yeah. And a lot of people need to be aware of what's really going on. China and Russia and all these major countries who pretty much said we are fed up with the West. We are tired. And here's what we're going to do. And it didn't just start within modern time. This has been going on for years. And a lot of these countries like China, Russia, they they are very like when it comes to things that happened to them in the past, they hold you accountable for generations and generations and generations. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't see this coming, that China was that China would have been the first one in Russia. They would, they're tired. So America has a long memory. Yeah. And people that. A lot longer than uh, America. You know, a lot of those countries are very traditional in their ways and how they can. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are America. You know, they they get rid of tradition and they want to take on some new freaking form of something. And, and these countries are they're going to run away, man. And we're going to be left in dust. We're going to be left in the dust. And uh, they're not going to understand why. Yeah. And fentanyl has a big deal with that right now, um, bringing it back to the opium war and people not realizing what's happening is that right now it is illegal for you to make fentanyl in China, but it's not illegal to make the precursors per per precursor. for fentanyl. Yeah, sorry. I had to get that out. It's not illegal for them to make that, and they can send that over to Mexico, where Mexico make the drug cartels make it, and then they send mm -hmm. it to the United States. So we are in our own opium war with China right now, and we don't even realize it. Or at least most people don't realize it, <laughs> is that the United States and citizens as a whole have been hooked on opiates through uh, Purdue Pharma and a bunch of other pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies. And they've been the Americans have been left holding the bag with that, and now pretty much you cannot experiment with any drug period that's how they killed prince by the way he thought he was just taking a vicodin like a normal vicodin but it was laced and and, and the thing got. with uh the thing like he said uh this for is this this opium war isn't it's with china and other foreign countries that are involved but it's not you know it's more with big pharma and our own government you know uh, opium is a lot of money in that for big pharma so to get rid of that, these pharmaceutical companies, they put that crap in everything and get people hooked, you know. Yep. So to get rid of that, it, they're, they're taking a big hit. So they will never in their life truly go to war over opium unless they want a total 100 percent control over it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Um, check the private chat there real quick, guys. Got a question about this. Um, so. The big picture for this, this, this particular opium war here is this, hmm. even if. Even if there are things going on on an international scene that have zero, and I, there, there couldn't be more zero to do with us than this. Um, it's seemingly that the U.S. government has to find a way to either interject to try and find a way to make money, take money, or share money with someone that they think is making a lot of money. Even if that comes at the expense of others but they'll also come as the good guy by telling you well since it's so bad over there i tell you what we'll make a <laughs> treaty with you so you can come over here now when you come over here though we're gonna have some criteria that you got to follow but at least you're not in china mm -hmm. and and that's exactly what they do now look at the immigration the way it is today oh it's bad over there come on over here they benefit from it because now they don't got to pay. It's in case people don't realize that the, the immigration thing is a is new age slavery. That's they come right. over, they pay, they make a little bit more money than most, but they don't ever get taxed. And they, they, but they are used, they are used by many to help produce things for the American population. Now, this is all by design because the government can't give them amnesty in most places, and they won't give them citizenship because if they did they would lose out on having to pay them cheap. Oh yeah. They would. And so it, it's, it's a continuation. They learned a good lesson from, from China. I'll tell you that much there. It's, it's been in place for a while now, but they've learned a lot from China. 
Yeah, and, and I think a lot of that, you know, this whole immigration is just going to implode and fall in on itself because, for one, China, you know, the minute China starts doing business, with a, they're probably cut off any travel to America. You've got Mexico jumping in on bricks. Uh, they're going to cut it off. You know what I mean? So a lot of these countries are going to cut off this cheap labor to America, and then America has to figure out what they're going to do because you're not going to be able to use all these people anymore for cheap labor. Mm-hmm. No, it's true. Um, my concern with BRICS nations and them changing the global reserve currency, which is what we're facing right now, is the only reason U.S. sanctions work is because we control the reserve currency. Once that goes away and that power goes away, it resets the board completely, right? So we would see the BRICS nation go, okay, U.S. isn't living up to what they're supposed to do. We are sanctioning the U.S., now mm -hmm. you're not allowed to import export or do any of the th these things they could do the same things that we've been doing to everybody else for years in one straight swoop and the american economy already since it's in a nosedive would just crash even more so hmm. especially the but, us dollar which is our but i have a question what if we were to call on the 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 nato debt that that we've been paying into from other nations that i mean i'm that's not happening mm. Right, but I'm just saying okay, if, okay, if, if, no, no. If, if you enforce that, we could, we could, and but only only through one person, Trump. Trump's the only guy I can see them paying money to. You're not going to get that from Joe because Joe's got his hands in their coffers too. Mm -hmm. Every president that I could recall have have their hands lined up with somebody else's money that they've sent to them. Obama did it for eight years. He'd yep. send money and get a kickback. Carter, send money, get a kickback. Bush, send money, get a kickback. Biden, send money, get a kickback. So there'd be no incentive for them to collect on a debt that they're making functionally work for them. Exactly. They have no reason to. But right. if you have no investments in war, like Trump doesn't, and you have no investment in other people's problems, like Trump doesn't, you're going to tell them you owe me money. Don't let me have to send a bouncer out there to find you. I'm going to send mm -hmm. me a, a collector and we're going to get that money. But we need that money because we got stuff we need to do with it. That's part of the reason why they're against him really being in there. It's not so much that he's going to run the country into the ground. They're afraid he's going to run it up into the sky. And that's the problem mm -hmm. because they have their hands in everybody else's pocket collecting money on the DL. So they don't want that change and they can't make that, that request to come back and pay us because they're actually making more money being with America being in debt than they would if America was to be in the black. That's and, the part. and, you know, I believe that all this BRICS nation and all this economy are collapsing this, and we're all not, we're not stupid. You know, most Americans with any type of common sense understand that this is all planned. And uh, I can see our economy crashing and of course, the UN coming in to save you or BRICS nation. Hey, we'll save you. And then that nation is going to be what America was to the rest of the world. Now, you what's going to happen? We'll see the colonization of the U.S. in the mm -hmm. same way that the U.S. and other European powers colonized the rest of the world. It's going to be that sort of issue because once those economies collapse, there's just going to be pieces to be picked up. And it's whoever wants a slice of the pie is going to need to be involved. And that's what we'll see with the BRICS nations is that we will see them coming in just like we did to Africa and to mm -hmm. Asia, picking up a slice of the pie. The The continental United States, I mean, the, the Americas in themselves, has a vast resource-rich continent yeah. to be mm -hmm. exploited. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to leave this place alone. That's right. Well, that's why I've been selling it out piece by piece. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly. why they've been selling out piece by piece. So I Alaska, think, right? Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say Alaska alone and the whale reserves. Oh, gosh. There. Didn't even get me started. Yeah, Russia, Alaska's got them gold up in them hills. Russia's taking yeah. that. So I, think, I think the official <laughs> census, unless you guys say no right now in the private chat. Um, mm. So you might want to take a look. I'm asking right now for a, a vote from the four. If the... Uh, Next one should be the Spanish American. Hmm. Yeah, I think so. that's okay. a, a good, good expansion on what happened to inside the continental United States. Right. So we'll tackle the Spanish American War on Friday. Um, 
You got to do your research up on that to make sure we're saying it right. Okay, just so you know. 1898, Eight. I think is when it was, 1898. Mm -hmm. um, the Spanish-American War is what we're going to be talking about. The Mexican-American War, because we were talking about the um, the Cuban-Spanish uh, uh, conflict, not the mm -hmm. American Mexican-American Civil War, which right, is where we right. had all this stuff out west. Yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, the uh, Cuba issue. The yep. war in Cuba independence kind of thing. So just understand that I'm not not the border Spanish. Right. Overseas Spanish. <laughs> I'd be the Mexican American war. Right? <laughs> the, the Europeans speak in Spanish or yes. Span the Spaniards. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the Spaniards. Their ancestors. Yes, Spaniards. Right. Just so you know. Um, so look forward to that conversation on on Friday. Um too strong will be back next week the mix will be back next week this is our vacation week and we are Spring taking break. it but we don't get a break on savage patriots because we ain't old enough to get a break we are just kicking things <laughs> off and eventually we're hoping that when this does get boosted to the next level which i'm, I'm very sure it will be um mm -hmm. we might be in 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 line for a, a break at that point but that's a ways off yeah that's at least a couple it of just... years off it just means that everybody who's listening in, chatting, taking the conversation needs to like, share, comment, subscribe. That's that's what that means. Right. All the above. And if you don't, uh, you're not good people. No, I'm just kidding. You're, you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're horrible friends. And you're I thought horrible, better horrible followers. Horrible followers. I don't know what to make of you no more. I'm hurt. Um, I'm distraught at this moment. I don't know how I'm going to make good. it. Oh, wait, chocolate. I have chocolate. I'll be fine. I have chocolate. I'm good. So we'll catch up on Friday, same time, 6.30 Eastern PM, and we will discuss with the panel of four the Spanish-American War of 1898. Arriba! Hope to catch you guys there. In the meantime and in between time, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. We are the Savage Patriots. We out.